So um, this was prompted by um, something Pope Benedict said just before being elected Pope, when he coined, if you like, the rather evocative phrase, but slightly hard to say, the dictatorship of relativism. Uh, there's an awful lot encapsulated in that, and it explains so much of what's going on, and it becomes ever more relevant. And he's addressed that theme quite a number of times since becoming Pope, and some of the quotes are in that document in front of you, which you can read at your leisure. And in fact, um, if the Iona Institute had to have a, a motto, and it's granted not a very catchy one, it would be fighting the dictatorship of relativism since 2007. So I'm going to try and explain what that is, all right, and what it's all about. So a word, obviously, in moral relativism to begin with. So no objective moral standards, nothing is right or wrong in itself. It comes down to opinion and circumstance. Um, one person's truth is as good as anyone else's. One lifestyle is as valid as any other. Um, all beliefs, now, <clears throat> the political implications of that are all beliefs, all lifestyles must therefore be treated as equal in the eyes of society and in the eyes of the law or else. Paradoxically, all lifestyles and beliefs will be treated as equal except for those which won't concede that all lifestyles and beliefs should be treated as equal. As I go on and explain what the word equal really means and what it doesn't mean, because we're all for equality. Uh, it depends on what you mean by equality. Um, so that's how our beliefs being thrown in the bin. So the rise, now again, the equality agenda sounds wonderful. And I'm going to explain again, again what this means and how the noble concept of equality uh, is sometimes misapplied and also how it often clashes with other values like we'd say freedom of association, freedom of belief, freedom of conscience and so on. Um, so now, if all lifestyles are equal, then they must be treated equally in the law, which is, as I say, part of the political implications of the notion that everything is morally equal. Uh, they must also be treated as of equal status and dignity by ordinary people, which again sounds wonderful and usually is, but can be problematic, again for reasons I'll explain. Hence the call to celebrate diversity, because if we to treat all lifestyle choices and all beliefs as equal in all the variety, well then we should really celebrate the great diversity of beliefs and lifestyles and so on that are out there. So there's many public education campaigns urging us to celebrate diversity. Um, hence, as I say, the public education campaigns around that area. So <clears throat> this agenda, which I suppose I should really call the dictatorship, the, the dictatorship of relativism, but it's an awful lot to be putting in the sentence every time, uh, challenges the church in a whole variety of ways. <clears throat> Faith-based schools come under attack for reasons I'll explain. The church's view of men, women and sexuality comes under attack, again for reasons I'll explain. Its view of the family comes under attack. Its role in public life comes under attack. Its view of itself is attacked. So I'll go into a bit more detail to these things. So the attack in faith-based schools, if equality is the only game in town, well then the admissions policies of denominational schools have to be problematic. Because of course you set up a denominational school to cater first and foremost for the community of faith for those who share the ethos and beliefs of the school. So Catholics or Protestants or Muslims or Jews or whatever come together and, we, and say, we will set up a school for our community. And therefore, naturally, in its admissions policy, it is going to favour members of that community first. And then if there's space still, at, still in the school, others will, uh, will be admitted on the proviso that they at least show respect to the ethos, don't have to believe it, but at least show respect to it. But of course, this is attacked as discrimination. Um, it is attacked as educational apartheid, it is attacked as segregation, it is attacked as divisive. All right, so you suddenly find ourselves having to defend the admissions policies of schools which never had to be defended before because it makes perfect sense to people that a Catholic school is set up first and foremost for the Catholic community and so on down the line uh, in respect to whatever religion we're talking about. Uh, the employment policies of, of denominational schools and indeed of any religious organisation are also accused of being discriminatory of treating people unequally. Because again, <clears throat> if a school is to maintain its ethos, then it makes perfect sense that the teacher should have, at a minimum respect the ethos. All right? Now, the maths teacher can believe anything really, because he's just teaching maths. But what would be unfortunate if he, if he used maths to somehow teach something that's contrary 
to what school teaches. Um, if he was the local atheist member openly of the local humanist society and was beginning to teach this, that might be problematic if he was beginning to get remarks into his class. I mean, I remember when I was in the university doing public administration, uh, who, who was one of our uh, courses, and the lecturer found all kinds of ways to get his political opinion into the classroom. Okay? So uh, a, a, a motivated enough teacher will always find ways to get his own opinions into the classroom. Now that is obviously going to be problematic if it's against the ethos of the school. So the question is, has the school the right to refuse employment of such a person, even if he's otherwise qualified? And to me, the answer has to be yes. Because if your admissions policy is taken away from you, and if you don't have the right to refuse employment to people who are going to go against your ethos, then what happens to your ethos? It surely becomes somewhat meaningless. And this, of course, doesn't only apply to religious organisations. It applies to secular organisations. So, for example, um, if you are uh, applying for the job of editor of The Guardian, presumably you must respect what the paper stands for. Even if you're a most superbly qualified journalist in every other way, Likewise, if you're going to be going to be for the editorship of the Daily Telegraph, presumably you're going to uphold what the paper believes. And you will be refused employment simply on the basis of your beliefs. Because you do not believe what the particular paper you're applying to write for or edit believes. So this is absolutely commonplace. But strangely, it is mainly religious organisations that find this right under attack. And of course, at the back of it, one of the reasons is because there's a belief that our beliefs are fundamentally and at bottom irrational. And there's no real basis for your discrimination anyway, because it's all a load of nonsense. Um, also, it is said what our schools and other religious schools teach discriminate. So there's something now called the Teaching Council. And it is equivalent in its relationship to teachers to what the Irish Medical Council is to doctors. It regulates them as sets of a code of conduct. And this code of conduct um, which is not quite part of the law yet, will have policing powers over teachers. It can, it can disbar them as teachers in the same way doctors can be disbarred and lawyers can be disbarred or struck off the register or whatever. So one of the uh, aspects of the Code of Conduct says you cannot cause offence in the classroom on the basis of marital status, religion, sexual orientation and so on. So I asked a question of the Teaching Council, what happens if somebody was to stand up a teacher and teach traditional sexual morality? Uh, in, like in its fullness, and was to say that heterosexual behaviour is morally normative, okay, and there's a gay or lesbian pupil, and they complained. Or supposing a Muslim school was to teach that, well, we believe that Islam is superior to other religions, and there's a non-Muslim who finds this offensive. And they said, well, we'd have to investigate that under the Code of Conduct. They didn't say that schools have a right to teach what they believe. They said if somebody finds it offensive, um, the uh, complaint would have to be heard and they, left, left, uh, and they just left it hanging in the air because if all lifestyles are to be treated exactly as equal then the first commandment almost becomes thou shalt not cause offence and it's simply disagreeing with what the teacher or whoever is saying might cause offence and of course it's a very subjective thing and suddenly you find yourself in trouble um, we're told that publicly funded schools violate church-state separation, no public funding at all should go to uh, church-run or religious-run schools. And of course this will be the position in the United States. Um, now the attack on the church itself, far more difficult, rather vulgar, uh, for the church to say it's the one true church. Okay? Now of course you can choose other language, but that was, that's been the long-standing claim when last I checked. But this is considered offensive. Uh, it has become much harder to say that Jesus is the way, the fruit and the life. And we discovered this in 2000 when um, the Vatican came out with a document you might remember called Dominus Jesus, Jesus is Lord. Um, and it, it said a couple of things. First of all, Jesus is Lord. The main reason that the document was, was produced actually is because um, in some of the interreligious dialogue, some of the Catholic theologians seemed willing to compromise the notion that Jesus is the way, the truth and the life and turn them into our way, a truth and a life. In other words, to relativise Jesus and to relativise the church. And then, of course, the thing that caused offence in this part of the world was um, uh, uh, Joseph Ratzinger and the then Pope saying that um, uh, Protestant churches just don't have the apostolic succession on churches in the true sense, they're ecclesial communities. Okay, so this caused enormous offence too. So the church saying what it believes um, uh, uh, causes huge offence, is hugely problematic, and causes uproar. 
So the church really, the pressure is on to say it is only one church among others and I've gone to a lowercase c and that Jesus is only a saviour. If he's a saviour for you, that's great. But he's not my saviour. In other words, he's not objectively the saviour. And this is, of course, what relativism is. You're not allowed to say, objectively speaking, um, and the Catholic Church is the one true church, you can't say, objectively speaking, Jesus is the saviour. You can only say he's a saviour. And if you're, glad, like if you're happy to belong to the church, well, that's just one tradition among many. And I can make no normative claims or ontological claims about itself whatsoever. So you must relativise those claims. And so the church actually, paradoxically, and again, here's what the dictatorship of relativism comes in, it must adopt relativism. And if you don't adopt relativism, you are going to be continuously attacked until you do so, until you bend the knee at the altar of relativism. That is the point I, I, I made earlier, that all beliefs must be treated as equal, except for those who would say all beliefs are not equal. So you must do this. Okay? And again, the dictatorship at work. A dictatorship of public opinion and sometimes law, increasingly law. So the church's view of sexuality, attacked for saying heterosexuality is morally normative or heterosexual behaviour is morally normative. Um, attacked for saying gender is not a social con construct. I put that in because a number of years ago, for example, there was a programme introduced to schools. It was a voluntary programme called Exploring Masculinities, plural. And the claim in the first paragraph of this was gender is a social construct. In other words, men, while they may be biologically men, in their social role could just as easily fulfil the roles which are fulfilled socially by women and vice versa. That apart from the obvious biological differences, there is no innate maleness and there is no innate femaleness. All right? Now, in fact, the neurosciences are putting a battering ram through that notion increasingly, that we're not tabula rasa, that there is actually a human nature. Um, now, it's more, it's more malleable than we used to think, but it is there all the same. The Pope gave a speech uh, at uh, Christmas two years ago in which he was saying, you know, there are threats to the natural ecology, to the environment, there are also threats to the social ecology. And he said one of those was the notion that gender is a social construct, pure and simple. And so, of course, when the church goes and says, therefore, not just the church, I mean, this is an Aristotelian belief and so on, that no, there is actually an innate human nature and there are actually innate differences between male and female, we're accused of being sexist. You're simply not allowed to say this. And so, by the way, when the Pope uh, pointed out this particular ideology as a threat to the social ecology, he was accused of comparing um, uh, homosexuality with the destruction of the rainforests. don't know how many of you remember that, but there was a lot of fuss about it. He never mentioned homosexuality anywhere in his speech, and he didn't even say... That, uh, so that, that these kind of gender construct theories are as bad as the destruction of the rainforest. He simply said, destruction of the rainforest destroys the natural ecology, the social ecology is destroyed by this other thing. Um, this is relevant because uh, there's a transsexual rights bill being considered. The transsexual rights bill, of course, is based on an ideology that you can, in fact, change sex, that even sex is relative. The sex you're born into can change and is relative. Okay? Um, so... Uh, and the two sexes get relativised, um, and um, the, the sex you're born into isn't fixed either. And your sexuality is also, you know, in terms, of, in terms of the moral status of your sexuality, that is also relative. But, I mean, there's a law they're proposing here in Ireland, and here's, it will allow for sex changes, so-called, to be officially recognised in law, including on your official documents like birth certs and passports. Now, I was in a debate about this maybe about a year ago, and I was naively suggesting, or rather uh, assuming that this would require a sex change, but no, it doesn't. It won't even require homo hormone treatment. It simply requires you to live for two years in the desired sex and to have this signed off by a doctor, a psychologist, a psychiatrist, or whatever. So therefore, as I said to uh, the person I was debating, therefore, I said, it's, just to get this straight, a person with a penis can be officially recognised as a woman and that this would be put in their birth cert and their passport and other official documentation and the answer was yes. Okay, so this will become law probably in the next year or two in Ireland and it is simply extraordinary. Gnosticism, how are you? If you think you're it, you're it. Okay, so again the church must be, uh, must be relativist in all these matters. 
So the attack on marriage, if all lifestyle choices are equal, then so, must, so are all families, okay, must be treated equally. Now, like when I say equal, um, of course all families must be treated with equal moral dignity. All people must be treated with equal moral dignity. But are all families equal in their effects on their members on average? Or are there, are there particular family types that tend to produce better outcomes for children, for example? And so in that sense, not equal because not equal in their outcomes, okay? But we're not allowed to say that, for example, marriage tends to produce better outcomes for children than other types of families because that's judgmental and offensive. So we're actually silenced. And the point here, by the way, is we're often told that there is a conflict between science and religion, uh, greatly exaggerated. The real conflict is between science and any dogma that is impervious to evidence. So, for example, you've got the dogma that gender is a social construct, absolutely impervious to the increasing evidence of neuroscience that it is not purely a social construct. It is innate in nature and as a social construct aspect to it as well. When the scientist E.O. Wilson, who's a biologist, was um, propounding theories of sociobiology, that this is the notion that a lot of what we become is determined at birth in our nature, okay, in our DNA and so on. He was roundly attacked because uh, the, uh, the alternative theory was we are blank sheets at birth and we can become anything through our upbringing and through our, uh, and through our socialization and so on. And so he, when he was propounding, and he's one of the, he's one of the great scientists of, of the modern age, when he was propounding his theories about sociobiology initially, his classes were regularly disrupted. He would have buckets of water dunked over his head and all that kind of thing. Now, that is not a conflict between science and political correctness, then there is no such thing, okay? And examples like this can be multiplied. So for example, the absolute refusal to admit, by the relativists, to admit that in fact, marriage tends to produce the best outcomes for children. Against all the evidence is another example of the conflict between science and political correctness that is raging in the present day. And the church, in fact, in all of this, finds itself on the side of science, curiously or not so curiously, but it will be curious in the point of view of popular opinion. Anyway, if, if all families must, must be treated exactly as equal in terms of law and policy, then it is wrong to give any special favour to marriage. It is just mental and intolerant to favour marriage. Um, so we must celebrate and recognise family diversity, and this would obviously include same-sex families. Um, now, just to go back there, I mean, I have a much longer presentation on this, but, I mean, the, the basic argument in favour of marriage is extremely simple. Marriage is the most pro-child of all social institutions. I have actually a, docu a small document here about it. It's the most pro-child of all social institutions because when children are raised by their own two married parents, a mother and father, it tends to produce the best outcomes educationally. Those kids, the girls, as they grow up, are less likely to become pregnant outside marriage. Um, the, uh, less crime, less drug abuse, less alcohol abuse, more emotional security and so on. The evidence for this is absolutely overwhelming. Okay? Other families produce, on average, less favourable outcomes for children. Lots of exceptions, but this in general is true. So if society accepts the evidence, and it used to until very recently, until political correctness took over, until this kind of relativism took over, if society ex will only accept the evidence again, then the, uh, then the argument in favour of giving marriage preferential treatment, special status. The status of an institution, therefore, becomes overwhelming. Because society, if it has children's interests in mind, must seek to maximise, insofar as is reasonably possible, the number of kids being raised by their own mother and father. And it would be a very strange society that became completely indifferent to the number of kids who were raised by the two people who brought the child into the world. And that is actually exactly where we're shifting. So in 1986, the number of children not being raised by their two married parents in Ireland was 12%, and now it's 26%. So when I'm told in programmes, which is not too far off the American and British levels, by the way, so when I'm on programmes and I'm told, David, we, we, mo like, we need to celebrate family diversity, what I always say in reply is, what you mean by that actually is more and more kids not being raised by their own two married parents. I can't see what there is to celebrate. It's 26%. Do we celebrate as it goes to 36%? and theoretically to 46% and up to 100%. Do we keep celebrating as more and more kids are deprived of this? I can't see what there is to celebrate. So when you actually step back and you ask, what are you asking us to celebrate? Okay, then brains begin to hopefully engage again and begin to think again. 
and begin to think rationally again. Because that kind of thinking, celebrate diversity, is a completely empty slogan until you ask, what are you asking us to celebrate? And it completely disengages the rational faculties, completely. It is an utterly emotional argument. So, the rise of equality, absolutism, or the dictatorship of relativism. I'm not sure if I have to point here, but I better make it. What does the, pr <coughs> the principle of equal treatment say? Everybody's in favour of the principle of equal treatment. It says this, you must treat similar situations in similar ways. But you can treat, and you must in fact, logically, treat different situations in different ways. Okay? So, if you take a child available for adoption, and there's two couples available to adopt, mm -hmm. and one couple, we say, each 30 years of age, and the other couple is 80 years of age each, all right? Who are you going to give the child to? Let's say they're equal in every other way. Obviously, you are going to uh, let the child be adopted by the younger couple, because the difference between the two 80-year-olds and the two 30-year-olds is relevant. Okay, now if it was a case that there was a child available for adoption and there was, uh, let's say, a mixed-race couple and a white couple, that would be an irrelevant difference, okay? And it would be discrimination to simply look at their race. Although, mind you, uh, there are um, councils in England do think that race is relevant in the name, again, of political correctness and that a child must be adopted by a parents of its own race. That probably makes sense, actually, um, uh, if, the, if that couple is available. But even when couples of the same race as the child are not available, these councils will still often refuse to let the child be adopted and keep it in a home instead, which is simply insane. Now, if you look, for example, uh, and assume that the two couples available to adopt a child, again, equal in every way, fine people, loving people, etc. One is a lesbian couple, one is an opposite sex couple. Who are you going to give the child to? I asked Ivana Babchik this question on Frontline in July, and she waffled and waffled and waffled. She said, it depends. And Pat Kenny cut in and he said, no, no, David Quinn has said they're equal in every other way. The only difference is the sex of the parents. A man and a woman, two women. That's the only difference. Now, is the difference relevant? If the difference is relevant, then it makes perfect sense to treat the two different, situa the two different situations in different ways. And this is where the whole argument actually stands and falls about gay adoption, about gay marriage, etc. If there is added value in a child having a loving mother and father, then that relevant difference must be taken into account. And the vast majority of people today will still say, given that choice, obviously the child should be raised by a mother and father in preference to two men or two women. And if you take the issue of homosexuality completely out of the picture, and we just say it's just two women, and it doesn't matter whether they're lesbian or homosexual or, or, or heterosexual, so you have two women or a man and a woman, and they're both equally loving, you will still try to give the child a mother and father. The difference is relevant. And what I find in these debates when I'm arguing against you know, people from gay rights groups, they try to pretend that the difference is not relevant, that the sex of the parents makes no difference. And here you see what they're trying to do is relativise the meaning of parenthood. What they say, you don't need a mother and a father, you just need loving parents. And what matters isn't motherhood and fatherhood as such, it's parenthood. Being a loving parent, that's all that matters, not the sex of the parents. And particularly if you believe, anyway, that gender is a social construct. And you see, therefore, what they believe is a man can be a mother, okay, and a woman can be a father. I remember being on a programme a few months ago when Tom McGurk was presenting, and he said to um, one of the people, I think, from the Gay and Lesbian Equality Network, he said, well, I don't know, he said, I'm old-fashioned enough to uh, be thankful that I was raised by a father who was a man and a mother who was a woman. All right? Um, but we have got to a point where you've actually got to say things like that. All right? Which, to me, is insanity. But what they're trying to do is relativise the meaning of parenthood and say the sex of the parents is irrelevant to the welfare of the children. And you will call it a bigot if you don't go along with that. Which, again, is the bullying aspect of this agenda. So anyway, let's go back here. The state is, mor is not morally neutral, as it claims. You see, the state says it's not for us to come down on one side or the other in a moral dispute. We must be neutral. But in fact, the state agenda is increasingly the imposition of this agenda. So, for reasons I'll explain. Uh, so, for this reason, it's better to call this equality absolutism. As I say, the term the Pope uses as a dictatorship of relativism. Um, so, this particular agenda subordinates all other social and personal goods to the supergood. 
So you're not allowed to have your admissions policy. You're not allowed to have your employment policy. You're not allowed to teach um, uh, the fullness of your faith in your school. Um, so this is monist in outlook, not pluralist. This is the curious thing. We're supposed to be in a pluralist society, but increasingly one view of the good, one view, and a very distorted view of the good. Because actually, as I'm saying, th there is a wholesale misapplication of the principle of equal treatment going on. Therefore, we're being, we're being forced to treat different situations similarly. Um, that is a monist outlook, not a pluralist outlook. Because a pluralist outlook says there's competing values in society. And sometimes you've got to hold them in balance. And sometimes you let this value win, and sometimes you let that value win. In this monist society, one value wins every time there's a clash. Every time. So as I say, the Pope calls it the, the dictatorship of relativism. Um, so how is this working in Ireland? Well, there's an attempt to repeal Section 37 of the Employment Equality Act, which upholds the right of religious organisations to employ by ethos. There's the general campaign against faith-based schools, so, for example, the, the demands to withdraw public funding from them. And, of course, the good that's lost there is the good of parental choice. Are parents the primary educators of their children? If the answer is yes, then the state must be the servant. And the state must do what parents want them to do in the field of education and not be dictating to parents, you must all send your kids, unless you're rich enough, to one-size-fits-all state schools. Okay? That's the alternative point of view to the parental choice point of view. The Catholic Church of Host parental choice always has. Um, but this other particular point of view says no, because if parents are left to their own devices, we're going to end up with segregation and apartheid in all these highly emotive, loaded terms. Um, there was the action against Dr. Phil Boyle last year. Dr. Phil Boyle is a fertility treatment doctor in Galway Clinic. Um, he offers fertility treatment in a, in, a, in a way that's compatible with Catholic teaching. One of the ways it's compatible is he will only treat married couples. So last year, a cohabiting couple came to him wanting um, his treatment. And he said, no, can't do that because we only treat married couples. So he was hauled before the Fitness to Practice Committee of the Irish Medical Council on a professional misconduct charge. And he only got acquitted on a technicality. Now he, to my mind, is still extremely vulnerable under the Equal Status Act. Because the Equal Status Act says... You cannot discriminate in the provision of goods and services on grounds of, for example, family status. So he is clearly discriminating in, under the terms of this Act on the basis of family status. And so if a case is taken against him under this Act, he will almost certainly be found guilty, and he will be fined, and he will be told to change his ways, and if he doesn't, I don't know what would happen. Would he be driven out of business? So suddenly you find that a doctor trying to run his practice in accordance with his Catholic convictions is in trouble with the law. So the state has not been morally neutral. The state's coming down on a particular side and coming down harder and harder all the time. Okay? Again, the dictatorship of relativism in action. Um, now, we had this Civil Partnership Act for same-sex couples. Absolute obdurate refusal by the government to insert a conscience clause. This means that we say a Christian civil registrar who doesn't want to officiate at a same-sex civil partnership ceremony, even if there is a co-worker who will, do, who will officiate instead, therefore the couple is in no way inconvenienced, still has to do it. And if they refuse, they can go to prison for up to six months. We are the only country I know of that has this law. In Britain, if a civil registrar refuses, they can be sacked. Here, they can face up to six months in prison. It is awesomely draconian. I remember getting on to Amnesty Ireland and asking, what's your line on this? Here you have a, somebody who could go to prison because they're trying to follow their conscience. Now, you are for prisoners of conscience, I believe. Who do you side with here? They sided with the state. Okay? So, you are allowed, in the eyes of amnesty, to, um, uh, to uh, dissent from military dictatorships, but not from the sex revolution. No dissent allowed. You can go to prison and be damned. Um, by the way, the Church of Ireland was looking for a conscience clause. That cut no ice. And in fact, Dermot O'Hearn was sending around letters to people looking for a conscience clause saying, and this is, I, think, I think this is incredibly Orwellian, no one can be exempt from their obligation, I underline obligation, not to discriminate. So in a, mor so in a morally relativistic age, which says paradoxically all lifestyles and beliefs must be treated as equally, suddenly moral obligations are imposed upon us. Now how does a relativist impose a moral obligation on anyone when they don't believe in moral obligations? But you have a moral obligation not to discriminate. Okay, no, no one can be exempt from their obligation not to discriminate. And of course, from our point of view, we're not discriminating. We're treating different situations in different ways. 
But as far as they're concerned, no. So they short circuit the disagreement. You're not allowed to have it. So um, uh, there's a lack of a conscious clause in the Equal Status Act that would protect Phil Boyle. Fortunately, the Constitution is rather good in this area. So what eventually might happen is the likes of a Phil Boyle will have to go to the Supreme Court and hopefully he'd win his case. Uh, because the Supreme Court holds these various values in much better balance than, our, than many of our laws are currently doing. Again, I don't know if I have it here, I might. Catholic adoption agencies in England and in parts of America have been forced to close because you know, they will only um, uh, consider for adoption or rather as, ado as potential adoptive parents opposite sex couples, not same sex couples. So they have been forced to close their doors. Okay. Um, so, there's a false view of church-state separation. There is the view that politicians shouldn't, the word let should be, shouldn't be in there, shouldn't let religion cloud their judgment. Now, this was Dermot O'Hearn, if you remember. So, just think about this. Here we have a government that has let its judgment be clouded by property developers, by bankers, by all the crony capitalists you, you, know, you can shake a stick at, by the social partners sometimes, but apparently they need only beware of the capacity of religion the cloud or judgment. Now that is just prejudice, pure and simple. But it is prejudice on stilts and that almost nobody complains about, except in rooms like this. But we don't have the Irish Times complaining about it in editorials, or the Irish Independent, or RTE, or whatever the case may be. The same politician, Dermot O'Hearn, that religious values should be left outside the door of politicians when they legislate, okay, outside the doors of their offices. Now, that begs the question, well, uh, Minister O'Hearn, what values do you bring into your office when you're legislating? Or do you bring no values? Because I think it's a very relevant question as, uh, as voters and electors. What values are our politicians bringing to bear? Are you bringing none? What are you bringing to bear? I want to know. And why do you leave only religious values outside your office door as a matter of principle? Okay, as a matter of principle. And there's basically a bouncer at the door saying, all you other values are allowed in, but if you're marked religion, you can't come in. Now, the usual answer you'll get is because religious values are divisive. Well, guess what? Any set of values are divisive. There is no set of values get universal agreement. So in that sense, every set of values is divisive. Or secondly, they say, well, look, religious belief is a load of irrational, superstitious mumbo-jumbo. Well, I think a lot of political correctness, as I've been trying to demonstrate, is irrational mumbo-jumbo that goes against the evidence. But I'm not saying it has no right to influence public life and law. But they're telling us our beliefs, as a matter of principle, have no right to be in the public square. And this is the aggressive secularism that the Pope has spoken about. Um, so as I say, the belief, this, is, this was uh, John Gormley. John Gormley was completely opposed to a conscience clause in the Civil Partnership Act. And he says, and he didn't spot the, you know, the total paradox, or rather the total contradiction here. He says, I believe in freedom of conscience, but not for old and discredited prejudices. So traditional sexual morality is simply an old and discredited prejudice like racism and has to be treated accordingly. So here we have the state once again not be neutral. Um, we had John Gormley also saying when the bishops came out with a very tepid statement last summer about the Civil Partnership Act, he said, I'm shocked. I thought the days were past when the church intruded on matters of state and that the bishops just stick to the spiritual needs of their flock. So again, John Gormley acting as the bouncer not allowing religious opinions to darken the doorstep okay, of the public square. And that's, as I said, a continuation of what he said. So combating this, define church-state separation properly. Church-state separation doesn't mean a public square cleansed of all religion. Church-state separation means only that the church should not be allowed to dictate to the state and impose its will upon the state, but likewise it means the state must not be allowed to impose its will upon the church and upon religious believers, except an extremist. And so clearly it is currently the state that is violating church-state separation. Because if you have the state saying to a Catholic adoption agency, you must do X, Y, and Z, because that's our morality, and your morality cannot be allowed to prevail against the official, uh, the official moral viewpoint, then it is the state that's violating church-state separation. When it tells a church hall, I mean, suppose you've got a church hall and you let it out for bingo. The law now is you must also let it out to the same-sex couple if they want to have their celebration after their civil practice of ceremony in your church hall. The state says you must let it out. That is the state violating church-state separation. We are conditioned to think that church-state separation exists to protect the state. It also exists to protect the church. And currently it's been violated by people who don't even know they're violating it. 
So, um, as I say, it doesn't mean separation of church and society. It does not mean a relegation of religion to the private sphere. The Pope said in his Westminster Address, religion is not a problem to be solved. But many people do regard aggressive secularists as a problem to be solved. And historically, they have sought to solve this problem in two ways. One is to exterminate it, as in the early days of the Soviet Union, or East European communism, or China, or Cambodia, or whatever. Okay? Exterminate it. It is such a problem, we need to apply a final solution to it, basically, by wiping it out completely from the face of the earth through violence and force. And of course, the 20th century has actually been the most hostile to Christians in our 20 centuries of existence. This is forgotten. And it was only within living memory. The Berlin Wall only came down in 1989. Now, it had been some decades before that when the campaign of violence against Christians and religious believers ended. But it is in, re it is in recent memory and only a few hundred miles from here that this campaign of extermination against the problem of religion was being waged. When they decided that religion could not be exterminated, they said, OK, we'll go to option two. We will quarantine it. We will not allow it into public life. Christians will not be allowed into certain professions, for example, medicine, teaching, because they're too sensitive. OK, so we, so we quarantine it. And in fact, if you take a country like Sweden, it is virtually impossible for a Christian to work as a doctor in a hospital in Sweden, because if you're asked, you must perform an abortion. No conscience clause admitted. All right. There was an attempt in the Council of Europe recently um, in the Parliamentary Assembly to pass a resolution to regulate conscientious objection and to say basically, and this wouldn't have become law, but it's a straw in the wind. It was defeated in the end. But basically the uh, thinking behind this resolution was women have an absolute right to reproductive health, including abortion. And if a woman comes into a hospital some night needing an abortion in inverted commas, and you are the only doctor on hand, it doesn't matter what your convictions are in respect of abortion, you must perform the abortion. All right? And this is already the law in countries like Sweden. All right? uh, it is also incidentally the case in Sweden, and I'm not sure if it's actually become law, but there's a proposal from the education minister that religious schools during prayer time are not allowed to teach the children that they're praying to something real. And the thinking behind this was religion can lead to fanaticism and next minute there'll be suicide bombers. I can't remember the last time a Catholic school produced a suicide bomber. Um, so, combating this, the point that the church-state separation works both ways, and currently it's the state that's violating it. Um, to show that the state can be a threat to the independence of the church and to religious believers. Um, the church, of course, as I say, has often had to fight for its in independence and even its survival. And the church, I mean us. Um, an excellent book on this whole thing by Michael Burley called Earthly Powers. It takes us from the French Revolution up to World War II, World War I. There's a companion volume called Sacred Causes that goes from World War I to the present day, and it is superb. And he doesn't pull his punches when it comes to the church, or the churches. But by golly, like, it's a real eye-opener as to various campaigns waged by various states in Europe against religion. Um, paradoxically, we need to relativize equality to show it's only one value among others, and it must take its place among other values. Uh, we need to point out it can, it can run counter to evidence and rationality, e.g. in the marriage debate, e.g. the claim that gender is purely a social construct. Um, as I say, with regard to family and, and marriage, evidence is marriage works best. With regard to gay adoption, do children have a right to a mother and father where possible, or is that right to be set aside? Um, with regard to schools, does parental choice matter? With regard to ethos, what is the place of religious freedom? Uh, with regard to religious teaching, what's the place of freedom of speech? These are the countervailing values. Um, it isn't, as I say, discrimination to treat different situations in different ways. Nobody's in favour of that. It's in favour of, uh, si of treating similar situations differently. The French Supreme Court, by the way, recently upheld um, the marriage of a man and a woman only because it said the French legislature is allowed to treat different situations differently. And that's no violation of the equality provisions of the French Constitution, a completely rational, sensible decision. So conclusion, a new moral relativism is, ta is taking hold, called, as I say, paradoxically, the, the dictatorship of relativism. Equality, as misunderstood, placed above all other values, it's a great threat to religious freedom. Uh, this new absolutism violates church-state separation. Uh, equality needs to be balanced against other values and rights, that is, it needs to be relativized, as I say, paradoxically. 
The absolutist nature of the agenda needs to be made plain and absolute starting with us. We need to understand exactly what this is. And that's it. Thank you.